and of seeing the face of God. And that's why it's announced by John the Revelator in Revelation 22, verse 4. And they shall see his face. Amen. Incredible. And that's why we have a song in our hymnal, you know, face to face as well. Well, I want to give you a little indication of what we're going to talk about today so that you'll understand how important I believe it is. And that is every person who leaves this earth alive will go through a time when they cannot buy or sell. Amen. This is the greatest infringement of religious liberty in the history of mankind. Because listen carefully what I'm going to tell you. It is not based on the color of our skin or the language we speak of where we were born. If you are a Sabbath keeper, you will not be able to buy or sell. Amen. How do we prepare for that time? Would that be interesting to anybody? Yes. We're going to talk about that. So it's kind of a combination of religious liberty and uh, stewardship. This is not in any of my books, but as I told uh, Pastor Sherrod last night, I have four presentations here, and I'm going to give him all four of them on, on thumb drive. So if you happen to want them or could use them in your church, you're welcome to do so. And uh, this is a lot of hours of work product for me, but it's a benefit to our church family. We can surely share it. And uh, we don't want it just sitting in my computer somewhere. Someday this computer is going to crash anyway, and then we'll lose the whole thing. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to do something about it before then. What I've entitled is The Stewardship of Religious Liberty in the Light of Satan's Last Big Temptation. By the way, we know this is going to happen, and I'm going to tell you how significant it is right now. When this happens, listen carefully, thousands and thousands of people will leave the Adventist Church immediately. We know that's true. We know it's absolutely true. Oh, I'll, I'll, I won't go into it. We have an awesome thing to know about, and that's Jesus has got the whole world in his hands. Yes. And we're understanding that more and more, because in the Bible it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The amazing thing about this is this particular thing. The first thing the Bible establishes about God is that he is the creator of heavens and the earth, and this forms the foundation for everything else the Bible says about him, and about who we are, and how we should relate to him, because he's the creator. Kathy and I had the opportunity a few years ago to go to India for three weeks to conduct an evangelistic meeting. We knew we were going to an area where there's lots of Hindus. So we studied about the Hindu religion. And guess what we found out? They have like 300,000 gods. So we tell them about Jesus and say, fine, now we have 300,001. What's next? How do you go about that? The bottom line is he's the God of all gods. He's the king of kings. He is the creator of everything. There's no other God that can say that. He is the God of all gods. He's the creator. Uh, when I was working in North American Vision, uh, my administrative assistant for 13 years was Lori Bryan. Some of you know Lori. And uh, she's very good at PowerPoint. So I said to her, see if you can find some beauty on this earth after 6,000 years of sin. Here's what she found. It's quite incredible. The most amazing reason that I show you this is for this reason. We just said in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But in John, the first chapter, verse 3, all things were made through him, speaking of Jesus. And without him, nothing was made that was made. Yes, sir. Isn't that incredible? Yes. Now, we understand something amazing. Here's what I'm going to get into today. Some hard questions about heart and treasure. These are some things, remember, we talked about last night. You can't serve God and mammon, money. How could the Bible's author and editor justify devoting twice as many verses to money than to faith and prayer combined? How could Jesus say more about money than both heaven and hell? Didn't he really know what was important? So the large volume of scriptural teaching on the subject of money demands our attention. Why does God give us all this instruction on money and possession? What is his point? Now, you know Jesus' ministry. Elder Sherrod and I were talking, and he mentioned it from the front this morning, about 40 years of ministry. I had 44 years of ministry. Now, this is incredible. How long was Jesus' ministry? Three and a half years. Now, this story is amazing. With so much to be said, so much he could tell us that we really needed to know, why did the Savior of the world spend a full 15% of all of his recorded words on this one subject? It's pretty important that we understand. Why did Jesus say so much more, say more about how we are to view and handle money and possessions than about any other single thing? And the enigma deepens when we look at how closely Jesus linked money to salvation. So I'm going to show you this now. 
this is not the sermon. This is the introduction. So we could spend a whole sermon on Zacchaeus, as you may know. So we're just going to go right down through this. What do we know about Zacchaeus? The chief tax collector. He was rich. In fact, we're told he was very rich. Short of stature. He wanted to see Jesus. Now please understand there's something about this that is very unique. Early in Jesus' ministry, as he was walking through the dusty streets of Palestine, there was a man who was a leper sitting way off from the street, and he said, Jesus of Nazareth, have mercy on me. If you touch me, I would be healed. The disciples gathered around Jesus. Do not touch this guy. Word will get to the Pharisees. You're going to be unclean. Your ministry will be history. But Jesus said, I will. And he walked through the disciples over and touched him and said, be clean. Yes. Would you like to witness something like that? This is incredible to me to understand. And then there was this lady that had been sick for so many years. She'd been all to the doctors and used all of her money up, all of her insurance and all of that. And she had not gotten that issue of blood healed. She thought to herself, I know he's busy. But if I could just touch his clothes. Yes. One guy wanted Jesus to touch him. This lady said, I'm just going to touch his clothes. Yes. And she did and she was healed. What did Zacchaeus want? I just want to see him. That's all I want to do. I want to see him. The awesome thing about this is that when you want to see Jesus, he wants to see you too. And this is incredible what I'm going to tell you now. So he ran, by the way, most of you have seen the Rose Parade on television on January the 1st. One of the thousands of people lined Colorado Boulevard in Pasadena to see the Rose Parade. Well, it's kind of like that when Jesus was preaching. You understand there was no church big enough for Jesus to have a sermon there. Is this true? Preach outdoors most of the time. Oh, and by the way, somebody asked, why do you use PowerPoint? Because I'm a teacher, and Jesus was a teacher. His two big sermons I told you last night, the first one, Sermon on the Mount, when he was seated, you know, he began to open his mouth and taught them. This is Matthew 5, 6, and 7. I didn't tell you the other one because we were having a little mic problems and computer problems. The other one, the most, nearly as long, two whole chapters, Matthew 24 and 25, the disciples came to him privately. And when he was seated, they asked him this question. What will it be like when you come in the end of the world? Matthew 24 and 25, the Jesus answer, all the red letter stuff in my Bible, probably yours as well. But anyway, he, when Zacchaeus came up to the main street of Jericho, where this was the rebuilt Jericho, where his tax office was, please understand that Zacchaeus worked for the IRS. Yeah. Yeah. So a typical business day for him as a CPA or a lawyer, he was in a business suit like I am today. So he goes to his office and checks his stocks in the Wall Street Journal and puts this little sign in the window, be back at 2 o'clock, and he knows Jesus is coming through town, so he rushes up to the main street, only to discover that people are lying 10 deep. And how tall is Zacchaeus? He's a short man. So he says, please give way. You know, I'm, I'm a short man. You should have thought about this yesterday. You're not getting our place. So what does he do? He ran ahead and climbed a tree. Now please understand this is not a little boy in short pants and tennis shoes. This is a grown man in his suit up a tree. This is really amazing. So we want to see what God's response is. Jesus planned to pass through Jericho. He came to Zacchaeus and he looked up and saw him. Then he called Zacchaeus by name, though they had never met. Do you believe he knows your name too? He does. This is incredible. And then he asked Zacchaeus to come down. Uh, uh, many of you know that my wife Kathy is with me here. We love to travel together. And uh, she enjoys the fellowship as well. But I will just tell you something incredible. Kathy is one of those old school type cooks. She can make stuff from scratch. You understand what I'm talking about? She can mix things up and make them taste good. And that's what John Boston was talking about, driving all the way to Florida to get the broccoli casserole. You understand the idea. Well, the whole point I'm going to make here is Kathy loves to entertain. Frequently when we're home, we have people at our house for lunch. But she does not like surprises. Do you understand what I mean by that, ladies? She kind of likes to know ahead of time so she can have things prepared and all of that. So Jesus invited himself home to Zacchaeus' place for lunch. And I believe his whole life passed through. Oh, no. He probably thought, well, I know this good Mexican restaurant that takes visa. We can go over there and have lunch. But you understand that when you get Jesus for lunch, you get 12 hungry disciples that don't get regular meals. So the 13 men are coming to eat at your house. Fortunately, he was rich. So he sends a servant along. Please tell them to cook up a big meal. We'll bring Jesus and all the disciples home for lunch. Now this is an amazing thing because the response was of this encounter with Jesus. Zacchaeus hurried down, of course. He joyfully received Jesus. Others criticized Jesus for eating with a sinner. But Zacchaeus' attitude toward money changed in one encounter with Jesus. 
He says, if I've taken anything I haven't restored, I'm going to give it back four times more, and half of what I have left I will give to the poor. Now, what was Jesus' response to Zacchaeus? He didn't say that was a wonderful idea. Awesome, go for it. What he said was, today salvation has come to this house. Would you like him to say that at your place? Yes. Sometimes it may change and take an attitude of money change or encounter with Jesus. So he judged the reality of this man's salvation based on his willingness, his cheerful eagerness to part with his money for the glory of God and the good of others. Now the Bible tells us that in the last time, the last and most trying temptation of Satan will be how, to, uh, how, well, how we can prepare for it. Here is the great and last trial God's people, faith people will have to encounter. No one can buy or sell except the one who has the mark or the name of the beast. Now this is Revelation 13, 17. Everybody understand that? Yes. Now this is very, very, very important. And what I want to show you is this idea. Ellen White states in Last Day of Events, page 148, in the last great conflict with the controversy with Satan, those who are loyal to God will see every earthly support cut off. Mm. Now that means tomorrow when I'm going home on my rental car back to... Tennessee, I'm going to have to fill up with gas somewhere. And I'm going to pull into a service station that puts this little blinking light where I put my credit card in. You understand? But when I put it in, it will say, sorry, no good. You get the idea? Yeah. My cell phone contacts will be cut off. The power will be cut off at my house. I will not be able to buy or sell. Rarely has anyone ever faced that. Every Sabbath keeper who plans to go to heaven will go through that time. Because they refuse to break his law and obedience to earthly powers, they will be forbidden to buy or sell. Ellen White had a couple of insights. I'm going to show you two of them today, where she actually saw one of the devil's workers' meetings. And she recorded it for us. And so here's Satan says, she heard him say, for fear of wanting food and clothing, they will join with the world in transgressing God's law. The earth will be holy under my dominion. This is the most powerful of all things that we can do to other countries. Put them under a financial embargo. You can't buy or sell with anybody. Surely it brings them around. Now just think about this. Most people can only hold their breath about two minutes. So you, air is probably the most valuable thing we have, right? You can go for several days without water, maybe even a month or so without food. But how long are you going to last if you can't buy or sell? All your stuff, your air conditioning is gone, your water is gone, your electricity is gone, your telephone is gone, everything is gone. So I just want you to think about that. The devil thinks I've got them now. So I'm going to show you how to prepare for that. Not being able to provide for yourself and your family will be a fate almost worse than death. Most of us pride ourselves in being able to provide for our families. What if you can't do that? How can a person or family prepare for this time? So I'm going to tell you, if you want to be successful then, there's three things that I will show you this morning that you must put in place in your life. And I'm going to show them to you right now. This is the three part of our sermon. By eliminating the three most significant elements that we can faith in God. Now last night I may have told you that I had just one string on my guitar. And when I was trying to, what does it always say? Get out of debt. Okay, so here we are. The three great hindrances to financial faithfulness. The first one that we'll discuss is debt bondage. Now this one is very, very important to understand. The second one, treasure stored up on earth. And finally, financial unfaithfulness to God. Now I'm going to show you these going along. If I'm in debt when I can't buy or sell, what can I do to protect my home, my car, my other assets, and my good name? Now the Bible says, this is interesting, where it says, the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is not what? Slave of the lender. You will never be free until you are debt free. Period. We'll go on. Scott Christensen is a Seventh-day Adventist who lives up in Maine, and he's the trust director for the Northern New England Conference. Just recently, he wrote a book called Planet in Distress. He was the ADRO leader for Mongolia and worked in China for a number of years. And because of his experience, worldwide experience working with ADRO, he recognizes something amazing. The decay of our global food system, the decay of our global climate, decay of our oceans. Are you aware that there are whole parts of the ocean that are dead now? Totally dead. Decay of the fresh water systems. People think there's plenty of water. About 90, what is it? A big huge percent of the earth is covered with water. You know, about 80%. Now this is incredible. How much of it is potable water that we can actually drink? About 3%. And if we pollute that, we've got big problems. 
the decay of our financial system, other problems with the things that we depend on for survival. So Scott, Scott Christensen, I just bought his book at ASI this, this, uh, a couple months ago, and I've read it. He, he ties these concerns into the great controversy and then gives two chapters on how to prepare for the serious changes that are coming. He begins by saying, eliminate debt. That's the first thing he lists. When we are in debt to the world, we are beholden to the world, we must remain engaged in the world in order to maintain our debt payments. In order to freely serve the Lord whenever and wherever He calls, we urgently need to eliminate debt. This is important. So, are we serious about being faithful to God at the end of being among those who will stick with Him and be protected from the plagues and be a part of the group that is translated to heaven? If so, then it would be wise to make a plan to get out of debt. Everybody know what ASAP is? As soon as possible. Okay, make a plan. The second one is treasures stored up on earth. Now this is quite an incredible thing because we get an education and we work hard to be able to live comfortably and to accumulate for our family and, and advance our cause and so on. But notice what this is. When the rich young ruler, who was a committed religious person, came to Jesus, he asked him what he must do to obtain eternal life. This is incredible. Jesus first told him to keep the commandments. He said, which ones? So Jesus started quoting some of the Ten Commandments. And he said, well, you can stop now. I've been doing that since I was a little kid. Was he correct about that? Yes. And so then he said to Jesus, what do I still lack? Then Jesus said, go and sell what you have and give to the poor. You'll have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Now this is amazing. And I want you to understand that why do you think that there's mention of the rich young ruler in Matthew 19, Mark 10, and Luke 18, all three synoptic Gospels? It's kind of important, isn't it? God mentions it three times. Now here's something incredible to think about. This young man was given an opportunity to follow Jesus. I have heard good preachers give a sermon titled, The Thirteenth Disciple. Jesus actually gave this young man a promise or an invitation to become part of the inner circle. Come and follow me. That's incredible. Can you imagine? Now, here's the story that I want you to understand. God does not ask every one of us to sell all of our stuff, give it to the poor, and become itinerant preachers and follow him that way. But he knew that that money was the young man's God and that was his only hope. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? That's the reason. And Ellen White talks about it in these ways. Desire of Ages 519, Christ gave this man a test. He called upon him to choose between the heavenly treasure and worldly greatness. The heavenly treasure was assured him if he would follow Christ. But self must yield. He must be given into, it must, his will must be given into Christ's control. The very holiness of God was offered to the young ruler. He had the privilege of becoming a son of God and a co-heir with Christ into the heavenly treasure. Now there was much more. Christ was drawn to this young man. He knew him to be sincere in his assertions. Now this is an amazing story, but I'm going to go to the next one here. Christ made the only terms which could place the ruler where he could, would perfect a Christian character. His words were words of wisdom, though they appeared severe and exacting, and accepting and obeying them was the ruler's only hope of salvation. Now I remember a number of years ago when I was just young in the ministry, I was in my 20s in my first church district, and I remembered after presenting a prayer meeting talk on the greatness of God and the vastness of the universe and so on, that he watches over each one of us. And I'm driving home in my little car, and I think, God sees me right now. He cares about me. And I convinced myself, at least at prayer meeting, that God is awesome, and I'm just thrilled to be a part of his plan. So I told God, I was just you know, driving my car, but I was just kind of in a mode of prayer, and I said to God, you have my permission to do whatever it takes to save me. Because when we get to heaven, everybody's going to say, heaven is cheap enough, right? But I didn't stop my prayer then. I kept saying something like this, please help me learn my lessons the easy way. <laughs> because you don't have to fry your brains on drugs to know what happens that way. You can see the lives of other people. Isn't that true? You understand. So here's the idea. He loved him so much. The ruler was quick to discern all that Christ's words involved, and he became sad. If he had realized the value of the offered gift, this is again Desire of Ages 520, quickly would he have enrolled himself as one of Christ's followers. 
He was a member of the honored council of the Jews, and Satan was tempting him with flattering prospects of the future. He wanted the heavenly treasure, but he wanted also the temporal advantages his riches would bring him. He was sorry that conditions such as conditions existed. He desired eternal life, but he was not willing to make the sacrifice. The cost of eternal life seemed too great, and he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Now let me just tell you a little illustration so you can understand how important what I'm telling you is. Assume for a moment that that exit sign over there is at creation. And there should be one over here, and that's the second coming of Christ, right? Between there, by the way, on the other side of it, out toward the office over there, is eternity past that God inhabited. On the future is eternity in the future where we'll all be with God, right? But in between here is about 6,000 years of time. In light of all of time and all of eternity, how long a space is your life? Just a dot. When I was speaking at GYC, I gave this illustration and I said dot com. Disappeared. You understand? <laughs> the whole point is, from that dot, a line stretches out and has no end. And it goes by the room, on out through eternity. And you live for God forever. If you're smart. Would you concentrate more on the dot or the line? The rich young ruler went away in tears because he realized he had just traded this earth for all of eternity. For money. This is incredible stuff that we're telling you about. Now this isn't a sermon yet. We're getting into it a little bit more here. <laughs> when Christ's followers give back to the Lord his own, they are accumulating treasure which will be given to them when they shall hear the words, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Remember what I told you last night? The money that we do to help others and we advance the cause of God is in our account in heaven. It's going to be given to us when we get to heaven. This is pretty amazing stuff. A lot of people don't know that. So do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and lust is destroyed where thieves break in and seal. So I always ask people when I read this, this is Matthew 6, 19. Why should we not store up treasures on this earth? The answer is right here. It's not safe here. It's not so much it's wrong, it's stupid. Do you see it's not safe here? But then it says, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. There it's safe. For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. By the way, Jesus said after these encounters to the disciples, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Not because God doesn't love them, but because they may be attached to their stuff. Very interesting. Now, I'm going to tell you a little interesting story. When I submitted the manuscript of my book, Even at the Door, to the review for printing, it's one of those 250-page books, they printed, they ran it out. You know, that's you give it to them on a disc or a thumb drive or whatever, and they, they'll run it out and see what it looks like. And they sent me an email back and said, we like the copy. The problem is you have all this bolding and underlining and italics you put in all of your book. And uh, this is not house policy. I mean, the review doesn't print books like that. And I, I appealed to them, and I said, you know, this is important to me. When I found this awesome stuff that I put in the book, I wanted people to know exactly where it was. Because, yeah. you know, when I went to law school, you can take a civil procedure case book, and you read like a 25-page tome of uh, small print, no pictures, no illustrations, and you have to find the one sentence where the whole case turns in that big page, of all those pages. So I said, I'm going to make it easier for people. I have stuff so great in my book that some of it is in bold italics and underlined. I mean, everything at once that you can do is done there. Now, I'm going to tell you something interesting. You can read through all nine volumes of Ellen White's Testimonies to the Church, or all five volumes of Conflict of the Ages series, and you'll never find anything in bold, or never find anything in underlined. But occasionally, Ellen White uses italics herself. This is one of them right here. By the way, if you only use it sparingly, it should be important, right? Yeah. Amen. This is Council on Stewardship 209. For all this accumulation of cares and burdens is born in the direct violation of the injunction of Christ who said, Lay it not up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. They forget that he also said, Lay up, here's the italics, not for God. God does not need the money. Does everybody understand God doesn't need the money? Lay up for yourselves, this is right what the Bible says, treasures in heaven, that in so doing they're working for their own interest. You're putting it into your own account. 
The treasure laid up in heaven is safe and no thief can approach or moth corrupt it. Very, very important stuff. But those who desire to be rich, the Bible says, fall into temptation and snare to many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Read into that get-rich-quick schemes. By the way, Adventist people should be aware that get-rich-quick schemes come into the Adventist church in the winter. And we're just approaching that, aren't we? This is incredible. Because around December 21, sundown is like 4.30 in the afternoon. And after the youth program in the afternoon, who goes to bed at 4.30? Nobody. Nobody. So what I'm going to tell you is some of your friends at church will say, why don't you guys come over to our place for some popcorn and pizza? We've got this wonderful thing we want to tell you about. Yeah. Most of the people that get involved with getting rich schemes are told about them by their friends who listen carefully, sincerely believe they're doing their friends a favor yeah. until the whole thing goes south. Mm-hmm. Now this is incredible. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So we're going to look at one more quick story. Then we're going to look at what I consider the most important one. This is a picture in artist's description of who do you think it is? Abraham. Abraham and Lot. Now God told them when they were leaving the 12th chapter of Genesis that he was going to bless them and be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. Was God able to do it? Let me just tell you, you think God can do whatever he says he can do? Abraham is a good illustration of that. But anyway, God blessed them so much, their, their livestock were so great, they could not dwell together. So Abraham called Lot one day and said, listen, we've got so many animals that God's blesses, we can't live close together, and it's not good for brethren to argue. So you go this way, and I'll go that way, or if you choose to go that way, then I'll go the other way. This is amazing. This is the 13th chapter of Genesis. What should Lot have said right there? Well, I'm just a junior man here. I mean, I'm coming along. You know, I, I kind of invited myself in. Why don't you choose? But he said something different. I've been looking around. And there's this beautiful valley over here, and the river runs through it. I'd like to go over there. And one of the saddest verses in all of the Bible is recorded in the 13th chapter of Genesis, where it says, Abraham stayed up on the plain. But Lot pitched his tent toward Sodom. The next chapter, of course, has him living in Sodom. Now this is incredible. Because one day, as an old man, 99 years old, Abraham was thinking about all the promises that God had made to him. Your kids, your descendants, will be like the stars of heaven, like the sand upon the seashore. One day, as he was sitting in the door of his tent, he saw three men going by. He did not know that it was God and two angels at that point. But give him credit for being hospitable. He ran out and says, I guess your feet are probably killing you. Why don't you come to my place and let me refresh you a little bit. We'll wash your feet and give you a morsel of food. How did he know that it was God who he had invited to his house? They did some small talk. You know, most of us have sold books in the past, and you don't just come to somebody's house. I've got some books I want to show you. You, you try to get in there some way. When I was younger in college, we were from the Home Health Education Service. You know, right? You understand. Anyway, when you get in, you don't just open your briefcase and start showing books. You look around in the mantle. Who's that nice young man in uniform there? Who's that couple in the wedding just getting married? Tell us about your family. So God said to Abraham, tell me about your family. Well, it's just me and my wife, and we're getting up there in years. I'm uh, 99 and she's 89. But God has told us that our kids are going to be like the sand of the sea and the stars of heaven. And God said to him, just tease him a little bit. Tell me again, how many kids do you have now? None. So, God said, about this time next year, your wife will have a baby boy. Now, this is amazing. Can God do whatever he says he can do? This is amazing. So, by the way, Sarah was inside the tent and was not visible, and she did not laugh out loud. The Bible says she laughed in her heart. But God said, why did Sarah laugh? Isn't that interesting? You understand. Well, the, you, you know the story. The same experience was those two angels, what God sent them on down to Sodom. I don't have a chance to tell you this whole sermon, but in this story, after arguing with the angels all night as to why they should not leave Sodom, as the morning dawned, the, the, you know, they had that strength of the homosexual community and all that stuff, and he went out to his kids and they laughed at him. This is incredible. But in the morning, the angel said, we can't linger anymore because it's coming. So one angel grabbed Lot with one hand and his wife with the other, and the other one got the two girls. And most of you will probably, 
you have to get to heaven because God has DVDs of all the time. <laughs> Please understand they did not go out through the gate. The gates were not open yet. The Bible says the angels took them and set them down outside the city. Levitated them right over the wall. And it was the voice of God, Ellen White says in Patriarchs and Prophets chapter 14, that God met them on the outside. The God who had stayed behind to talk to Abraham. And it was God's voice that said, do not look back. This is amazing now because Lot argued with God. With God and two mighty angels. One angel killed 185 soldiers in one night. One angel rolled back the tomb, you remember. All this stuff. Two angels and God is right there. If I go to the mountain, some wild animal will get me. And he probably said something like, in my back. I haven't slept on the ground since I was in Pathfinders. There's no way I'm going out there. There's this little village over here called Zoa. Could I just go over there? And while he's arguing with God, as you remember, his wife, his wife looked back and became a pillar of salt. A lot of you don't realize that Ellen White adds another word to this, and she says she became a pillar of salt forever. Apparently she died the second death on the spot. Why did she look back? She looked back because her heart was still in Sodom, her stuff was still in Sodom, and her children were still in Sodom. Now this is pretty amazing stuff because in one of the shortest verses in the Bible, Jesus says in Luke 17, 32, remember Lot's wife. Every person who leaves this world alive will have to make the same decision that Lot's wife faced. What are you going to do about your stuff? What are you going to do about your friends? What are you going to do about your personal safety? Are you going to follow God? You have to make that decision. The answer is yes. That's the important thing. No person or anything is worth trading for eternal life. So we all understand that Lot entered Sodom, a wealthy man who came out with nothing. On the other hand, Jacob left home with nothing but a shepherd's rod, as you know, returned a wealthy man. God blessed him because of his faithfulness in tithing. You can read about it, 4th Testimonies 466 and 467, Councils on Stewardship, page 99. So the love of money and the desire for wealth is the golden chain that binds people to Satan. The work of God is to be more extensive, and if his people follow his counsel, there will not be much means in their possession to be consumed in the final conflagration. All will have laid up their treasure where moth and rust cannot corrupt, and the heart will not have a cord to bind it to this earth. Well, I'm going to share this one with you, and then we're ready for number three. And this was important. He who embezzles his Lord's goods is not only loses the talent lent him, now this is, uh, but he also loses eternal life. Of him it is said, cast you the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. The faithful servant who invests his money in the cause of God to save souls employs his means to the glory of God and will receive the commendation of the Master. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. This is volume 3 of the Testimonies, 387. So, when our treasures are stored up on this earth, the closer we are to death or the second coming, the more stress is going to be on our hearts. What's going to happen to our stuff? But when our treasures are stored up in heaven, the closer we come to the end of life and the second coming of Jesus, the more excited and eager we will be. Such people will look with great joy in the prospect of leaving this earth behind. Very important. Because where your treasure is, your heart will be there also. Now, here's the one that's most amazing. You probably have never heard anything presented like this before. And believe me, you can teach old dogs new tricks because I've only learned about this in the last couple of years myself. It's very, very important. Financial faithfulness to God. I'm going to show you something now. This is the view of the devil's workers meeting that Ellen White had. She says selfishness and material plays a major part in the Great Congress. He testimonies to ministry of 474. This is the devil's workers meeting. You know, we have workers meetings in the Adventist church where pastors and teachers get together and so on. Here's what the devil said to people at his workers meeting. Go make the possessors of lands and money drunk with the cares of this life. Present the world before them in its most attractive light. They may lay up their treasure here and fix their affections upon earthly things. Now let me just stop there and ask you, do you think the devil has been successful so far? Yes. This is pretty amazing. We must do our utmost to prevent those who labor in God's cause from obtaining means to use against us, keep the money in our own ranks. The more means they obtain, the more they will injure our kingdom by taking from us our subjects. If Elder Boston doesn't have enough money to fund that school, it's not going to happen. Do you understand? That's why we took the offering today. That's why we, many of us made contributions to that. Here's the interesting thing. Make them care more for money than for the upbuilding of Christ's kingdom and the spread of the truth. We need not fear their influence. 
Now, Ellen White didn't underline this. I did. For we know that every selfish, covetous person will fall under our power, will finally be separated from God's people. Very interesting. So what is the significance of tithing? I'm going to show you things. I'm going to put all these up here. One of the reasons I use PowerPoint is because I know I talk fast, and if you want to copy down the references, you can get them down. The tithe legislation in the Bible is not Malachi 3.10. That was a remedial thing spoken to people that had been unfaithful. The tithe legislation is actually given in Leviticus 27, verse 30, at the time of Mount Sinai. And it is, all the tithe of the land is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. Now I'm going to ask you a question. What could God do with his tithe if he wanted to? I'm trying to give you the answer in the question. Somebody answered it properly. Anything he wanted to. He could take the tithe back to heaven if he wanted to, couldn't he? It is his tithe. Or he could also do like they did with the beautiful lambs that were brought, the ones without blemish. When the people sinned, they brought their sin offering. What happened to the lamb was that the person was to slay it with their own hands. An innocent lamb, one that was their favorite one. The priest would collect some of the blood and sprinkle it in the appropriate places, but what happened to most of the lamb that got burnt up? Everybody understand that part? Yeah. So if, how would you feel if after the deacons received the offering on Sabbath morning, they separated out the offerings from the tithe and then brought the tithe up and put it in the little cauldron and poured some lighter fluid on it, it uh, you know, lit it and just burned it up? Could God do that with his tithe if he wanted to? Yes. He actually could. But God said in Numbers 18.21, I have given the tithe in Israel to the Levites as an inheritance in exchange for the work they do, the work of the ministry of the tabernacle. Yeah. Now this is incredible. God said, I could take it back to heaven, I could burn it out, but I've decided to support the ministry with this. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Please understand that when you tithe, you're not supporting the South Atlantic Conference, or Georgia Cumberland Conference, or the Southern Union. You're giving your responsibility back to Almighty God. Yes. Isn't that true? Yes. Then God does with His money what He wants to. And what He wants to do is support the preachers. By the way, I mentioned this to you last night, but if you ever have a question about tithing of any kind, the answer in the Spirit of Prophecy is in one place. Ninth Testimony, 245 to 252. Ellen White was asked to give a presentation to the constituents of meeting in California. This is what she gave. By the way, there was only one conference there then. Now we have four conferences. You know, it's a big, lot of address. Faithful Church. For example, I was actually the secretary of ASI at the General Conference for three years. Uh, we were very proud of the time we were there. It was the first time the membership went over a thousand, first time we had a million dollar offering, and so on. Now, you know, it's, it's old hat to raise a million dollars today aside. But I just want to tell you something incredible. I believe in supporting ministries. Amen. Did you hear what I just said? Yes. I believe in them. There are many of them. Kathy and I support many of them. But what I want to tell you is this very important thing. Because they're doing a good work, should they receive our time? No. What would Ellen White say in this thing? These ministries should be supported, but not from the tithe. Yes. That's an exact quote. Anytime you look at Ellen White's writings, you can find the answer to your question on tithing right there. Now, here's something that you didn't know about tithing that I just discovered a few months back. God established the tithing system to protect us from selfishness and to encourage us to trust Him. Amen. So Deuteronomy 14, 22. By the way, what is Deuteronomy all about anyway? Deuteronomy is Moses' last four sermons to Israel before they crossed over into Jordan. And so he's going through all of God's blessings and all the promises and all the counsel that God gave. Then he says, You shall surely tithe the increase of your grain that the field produces year by year, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. Now what does it mean in this setting to fear God? I'm going to show you what it means. In the, in the prob, Psalms and Proverbs, there's what we call poetic parallelism. Many of the Psalms say the same thing twice. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, the knowledge of the Holy is understanding. You know, it says it two different ways. So here's one of the Psalms, Psalm 31, 19. Oh, how great is your goodness, which you have laid out for those who do what? Fear you. Then the second half, saying it a different way, says, which you have prepared for those who trust you. Trust in you. So the fear of the Lord is trusting in Him. Now, I'm going to give you just a brief illustration here, and I hope that you have already read it before. If not, write it down. 
It's the kind of thing that you would expect to see in early writings, but instead it's in volume two of the Testimonies, 594. Ellen White named it an impressive dream. She had over 2,000 visions and dreams in her ministry to the remnant church and the world. This is the only dream that she said about this. As long as I live, I will never forget the detail of this. Incredible. So she said, well, at Battle Creek in August of 1868, this is just about five years after the church was organized, I dreamed of being with a large body of people. A portion of this assembly started out prepared to journey. We had heavily loaded wagons, and as we journeyed, the road seemed to ascend or go up. On the one side of the road was a deep precipice. On the other side was a high, smooth white wall, like the hard finish upon plastered rooms. As we journeyed on, the road grew narrower and steeper. Has anybody here ever heard this before, the impressive dream? Okay, I'm going to tell you something now. I found a picture of the place. There it is. Only this is the closest I could ever find to it. This is a walk you can take in China. But the interesting part about it, look how far you fall if you step off the trail. But there's boards to walk on. In Ellen White's impressive dream, there's nothing to walk on. There's just this little narrow ledge. And there's also a chain you could hold on in this picture, but there's no chain. So I'm going to tell you just the rest of the story, really quickly in my own words, so it can go faster. Ellen White says, as we journeyed on, the trail got narrower and steeper. It's still real steep off one side and real steep up the other side. But then she said something amazing. We realized we couldn't travel on safely with two horses side by side, so they let the horses go from the wagon. Uh, I don't know if it went over the bank or what happened, but they put the horses single file and started riding them that way. Then their knees were banging on the wall and for fear they were going to fall off. So I got off the horses, let the horses go, and started on single file. I don't understand this next part. Some of you might. They took their shoes off and were going barefoot. I could hardly walk on anything barefoot, but they were doing this. They saw blood on the trail. You remember that. But then something amazing happened. And you know what I'm going to tell you next. She said a little cord was let down beside each person. And not to hold on to for your whole weight, but for balance. You understand the word balance? Now, most of you have worked in Pathfinders, you've been in Pathfinders, whatever. If you take the Pathfinders to Great Smoky Mountains and you're going to cross the, 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 the big stream on a log, half the Pathfinders are going to fall in on purpose. <laughs> or, or they just couldn't make it. You understand? But if you stretch a rope across and just have something to balance on, there's no excuse for not being able to go across. You understand? It's just for balance. Mm -hmm. So anyway, if this little cord comes in, now listen carefully what I'm going to tell you next. The amazing thing is, as they journeyed, the cord kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And finally, it was as big as their whole body. And when they got to the end, right out here, the directions were swing across. So I'm going to show you something. This is a picture. Kathy and I had a big poplar tree taken out of the backyard when we lived in Maryland. This man is perfectly at ease swinging around on a rope from a tree because he knows it will hold him up. It's only about a half inch braided nylon rope, but it's very, very strong. It's got like a 10,000 pound test. Believe it or not, you guys don't know this about me, but when I was in seminary and Loma Linda, I did tree trimming work and I've done that before. In fact, if you've ever been to Loma Linda, there's probably 500 palm trees in Loma Linda and I have been to the top of every one of them trimming palm tree fronds. You don't use a rope like this just as belted spurs. But anyway, the most amazing thing is when I did tree trimming for people and I would climb, we weren't wealthy enough to have one of these bucket trucks. You know, we would have to climb up in the tree. We'd throw a rope over the top and tie it to our saddle and swing around and cut off dead limbs and whatever needed to be done. But here's the interesting thing. I knew for sure that a half inch rope would hold my weight. But just to be sure, I would use five eighths or three quarters so I didn't worry. Do you understand? People would laugh at me when I had those big ropes, but you can't work when you're scared. You understand? So I'm going to tell you something. Listen carefully. Every time I tie, my rope gets bigger. Yes, sir. When I get to the end of the trail, my rope is going to be this big. And I can lift up my feet and swing across. But if I've been one of those people that criticizes the church or the conference or say that uh, the, the conference has all the money, if they can build that place here, uh, what's this? River Oak. 
They don't need my money. Have you ever heard people talk like that? Or God knows how poor we are. I'm going to show you something amazing just a minute. But the thing is, this is incredible now. If you haven't got a big rope when you get to the end, you're not going over. That's when thousands of people leave the Adventist church. Do you understand what I'm saying? So Kathy and I can tell the devil at that point, take the hike. God has kept us so far. We've been faithful to Him. We're going to trust Him from here on. And I feel like Elder Boston when he said, I'm going to be on the Sea of Glass. Are you going to be there? You're going to be there if you've been faithful. But if you haven't been in a great temptation, you're gone. Absolutely gone. So there you go. What is the devil's last and most effective temptation to God's people? Financial bargain. You can't buy or sell. Has God made provision for this time? The answer is yes. How? By teaching us to trust Him with our daily lives, He established the tithe. Very simple. So when you get to this point in your life, no problem. I want to tell you something amazing. It was right when Lori first started working with me at North American Division that we decided to write these books about over and over again, all the blessings that God has, has given to His people. We've got 150 stories from people who know that God blessed their family because of their financial faithfulness. In fact, if you've been at General Conference, typically the directors have this office so they can close the door and the administrator sits out in a little cubicle with you know no top on it. And you really can't see each other, but Lori and I, I would come out and talk with her and she would roll her chair back and we would talk. One day, she rolled her chair back and she looked into my office and I had tears coming down my cheeks. And she'd never seen that to me before, of course. So she said, Elder Reed, are you okay? And I said, yes, I've just been reading three testimonies that somebody sent to me. And they're so incredible. So, you know, she had just slipped the mail open and handed them to me and I read these testimonies that were coming in. So I handed them to her and said, you take a look. So she read them and pretty soon she slid her chair back and tears were just streaming down her cheeks of what God did for his people. This is so amazing. We sold 93,000 copies of that book. By the way, the typical book printer to review sends only 3,000 copies, 93,000 copies of it. And when it was circulated around North American Division, we got another 150 stories spontaneously sent in to us by people saying, you think God is great to your family, you should hear what he did to our family. <laughs> Those people are building strong ropes, my friends. That's what's happened. Very, very interesting. Okay, we're going to go along here. Very interesting. God's plan in the tithing system is beautiful in its simplicity and quality. Great objects are accomplished by the system. The treasure will be full if, adopted, if all adopt the system. And the contributors will not be left the poorer. Through every investment made, they will become more wedded to the cause of present truth. Your rope's getting bigger. So, the, tree of, the tithing of the tree of knowledge is good and evil. Don't think Adam and Eve were the only people that were tested. Because here's what we found. The tithing system for us is the equivalent to the last day Christian of the tree of knowledge of good and evil to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And a lot of people don't know that. I even heard uh, Larry Burkett and uh, Howard Dayton and others who are not Christians mention this fact because it's so clear in the scriptures. Ellen White mentions it a Council on Stewardship, page 65. So notice this. There was nothing poisonous in the fruit itself and the sin was not merely yielding to appetite. It was distrust of God's goodness disbelief of his word and rejection of his authority that made our first parents transgressors and brought into the world a knowledge of evil. So, if I'm faithful with my tithe, I tell people and God that I trust his goodness, I believe his word, and I accept his authority. Does that make sense? Yes. Same things with the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Very interesting. He who gave his only begotten son to die for you has made a covenant with you. What is a covenant? It's a promise, a contract, or an agreement. And he gives you his blessings, and in return requires you to bring him your tithes and offerings. The blessings always come first, as you know. So I'm going to look at this one and just show you a couple of things as I close this presentation. There are three elements to an honest tithe. In English, they all begin with the letter P. The portion of the percent, which is? One tenth. The place to return it is? The storehouse. By the way, where is the storehouse? Kind of interesting. The only one that people have questions about is this. Some independent ministers will tell you the storehouse is wherever they're preaching the truth, we're preaching the truth. <laughs> According to the biblical principle, let me tell you, 
when I was working at the General Conference, I had the privilege of being on the Houston Tide Study Commission for three years. We met about six times. And that was just before the General Conference session in the year 2010. And a real interesting thing happened. Seven of the 90 members, and I was one of the seven, were asked to do research and present their research papers to the group. Mine was, where is the storehouse? And what I found was amazing. I could get, I, mean, I have a whole seminar just on where is the storehouse, but I will just tell you, the storehouse is the place from which the pastors are paid. In the Adventist church, the storehouse is the conference office. Please understand that the pastor does not come to the church treasury on Saturday night and say, I need some money to pay my rent. This is not gonna happen. The tithe always and only goes to the storehouse from which the pastors are paid. Is this true? This is the Adventist system that we've gained from the scriptures. Very interesting. That's the storehouse. By the way, for the convenience of the members and part of our worship experience, we return our tithe to our local church, bringing our tithes with us, of course. The purpose, of course, is to support the ministry of God's church. The Lord doesn't need our offerings. We cannot enrich Him by our gifts. So it should be our highest aim in life to get rich. Right? No. To get ready for heaven. That's fifth volume of manuscript releases, page 255. Our Heavenly Father did not originate the plan of systematic benevolence to enrich himself, but to be a great blessing to man. He saw that this system of beneficence was just what man needed to prepare us for that time. Kind of interesting. So I have about four more slides, but I want you to see these. The majority of professed Christians part with their means with great reluctance. Many of them do not give one twentieth of their income to God, and many of them give far less than that, while there's a large class who rob God of a little tithe, and others who will only give the tithe. This is fourth volume of the testimonies. But notice here, if all the tithes of our people flowed into the treasure of the Lord, as they should, such blessings would be received that gifts and offerings for sacred purposes would be multiplied tenfold. Thus, the channel between God and man would be kept open. Now, I'm going to ask you this question. God says if we're all faithful, He's going to bless us so much that we can give ten times more in offerings. What percent increase would that be? A thousand percent. A thousand percent. God said He would bless us so much that we would have a thousand percent more to give. Now, I happen to know, because I have a master's in public health, that Loma Linda is one of the three or four places in the world that's called a blue zone because people live longer there. Yeah. And that's because many practice the Adventist health message. Do you know that if we practice the Adventist health message as we are given it, that we'd, we'd be much healthier than we are as a people? But I believe also that God gave us this testimony regarding money management. We'd be a lot more prosperous than we are if we were faithful as well. Does that make sense? You understand and then the channel between God and man would be kept open. So the followers of Christ should not wait for throwing missionary appeals to arouse them to action. If spiritually awake, they would hear in the income of every week, whether much or little, the voice of God and of conscience with authority demanding the tithes and the offerings due to the Lord. So my last short illustration is this one. One day Jesus took his disciples to the temple to teach them a lesson. And he, uh, in, on purpose, positioned himself near the treasury, where the big, rich, fat cats would come and dump out a bunch of coins in there and sound like the end of the world, hitting all those, you understand, a big thunderstorm or something. And then here comes this poor little widow lady, and she dropped in two copper coins. By the way, Jesus observed that and knew what kind of coins they were. This is interesting. Then he turned to the disciples and said, as long as men live, they'll remember this lady who gave the widow lady that gave not of her wealth, but of her poverty to sustain the church. She's going to be remembered. You guys remember that part? Yes. Listen carefully to what I'm going to tell you now. The only offering Jesus ever commended was when a widow lady gave her last two cents to a church that was just about to kill him. Is this true? Now this is incredible. So somebody's going to come along and tell me, there's so many problems in the church. We've got emerging church. We've got celebrations. I'll call them kind of foolishness going on. Skits, you know, all kinds of goofy stuff. I'm not going to support that place. Tell them about the widow. So somebody gave me vision number 24 of this guy who says he's an Adventist prophet. And it was 
talking about if you support the Adventist church with your tithe, God's going to hold you responsible for all the foolishness that's going on in the church. And you may miss your eternal life. It turns out this guy was receiving tithe himself. But the bottom line is, I found this statement, and so I printed in my pastor's newsletter that I sent to all the pastors in North America, the false prophet of tithing. And here's what I put in there. Those self-sacrificing, consecrated ones or people who render back to God the things that are His, as He requires of them, will be rewarded according to their works, even though the means thus consecrated be misapplied so that it does not accomplish the object which the donor had in view, the glory of God and the salvation of souls. Those who made the sacrifice in the sincerity of soul with an eye sinner with the glory of God will not lose their rewards. Do you understand? God's involved here. Second Testimonies, page 519. So whenever God's people in any period of the world have cheerfully and willingly carried out His plan of systematic benevolence, that is tithing, and in the gifts and offerings they have realized the standing promise that prosperity should attend all their labors just in proportion as they obeyed His requirements. When they acknowledged the claims of God and complied with His requirements, honoring Him with their substance, their barns were filled with plenty. Third Testimonies, 395. And this is our closing statement. To the faithful servants, he said, well done. Good and faithful servant, you were faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. The words well done are only spoken to those who manage their money Christianly. And the reason is because they've learned to trust God with their money. So I'm going to close with the Bible scripture. You may want to turn to it in your own Bible. It's Romans 13, verse 11 and following. We all agree last night in my presentation that we're living in the end times and the world's in a mess, right? Yes. And do this. This is Romans 13, 11. Knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Those are the words of God's holy word to us as we conclude today. I want to thank you for your kind attention. This afternoon we're going to have a presentation on stewardship first and then my last one is going to be the one Sunday chatter. And I think that will probably be the most interesting one that I've given you, but it's amazing information. And you'll be glad that you're a Seventh-day Adventist and you understand what's going on in the world. Do we have another? Okay. All right, thank you. Amen.